The main two-footers had a mystique all their own. They were the smallest real railroads to operate in America, all clustered together in one geographic region, serving the rural communities of the state of Maine from the 1870s until the onset of the Second World War. They were the minivans and pickup trucks and Federal Expresses of their era, the era before paved highways, serving the day-to-day -day transportation needs of their communities. They were a living link to the outside world of mainline passenger trains and manifest freights. And they accomplished their mission with a unique sense of utilitarian style. The little trains squatted over their two-foot gauge track with all the grace of a fat lady on a bar stool. But they carried on with the mainline authority of a rousing exhaust and melodious whistle. The two-footers traced their history back to Wales in the 1830s, where industrial tramways like the 13-mile Festiniog Railway carried roofing slate from the rugged hills down to the waterways of the seacoast. The earliest system of gravity downhill and horses to return the empty cars uphill soon gave way to steam power, and fully functional railroads developed upon the two-foot gauge track, actually set to the bizarre dimension of one foot 11 and a half inches. In the early 1870s, George E. Mansfield of Boston visited the Festinia and was so impressed by its efficiency that he brought the idea home and helped to create the Billerica and Bedford Railroad in Massachusetts, a few miles north of Boston. But the eight and a half mile railroad, which opened for business in September 1877, operated for only nine months before going bankrupt. The following year, however, the salvaged hardware from the defunct B&B &B was transplanted to Franklin County, Maine to become the genesis of the Sandy River Railroad, which would eventually grow to become the largest two-footer in America with a route map of 110 miles. Soon other two-footers began to spring up in the piney woods of Maine. The 21-mile Bridgeton and Saco River was begun in 1883, followed shortly by the 6-mile Monson Railroad. The even smaller 5-mile Kennebec Central opened for business in July of 1890. The fifth and final of the major Maine two-footers was begun in 1894 as the Wiscasset and Quebec with ambitions of building all the way to Canada. Eventually, the Wiscasset, Waterville, and Farmington settled down on 58 miles of track from the sea coast northward into the fields and timberlands below Waterville. By the First World War, the two-foot empire was established and thriving in Maine, but the concept never expanded into any other parts of the country, where the somewhat larger three-foot gauge became the national standard for narrow-gauge railways like the East Broadtop in Pennsylvania and the Denver and Rio Grande in Colorado.
It was paved roads, the automobile, and the truck that did in the two-footers, beginning in the Great Depression. The scrap iron drives in the early 1940s sealed their doom forever, and virtually all remnants of the narrow gauge would have been lost had it not been for the vision of a wealthy cranberry grower from Massachusetts by the name of Ellis D. Atwood, who was a longtime fan of the toy-like little railroads. When the Bridgeton and Harrison, successor to the Bridgeton and Saco River, abandoned in 1940, its newest locomotive, number eight, was purchased from the scrap dealer by rail fans Richard Holt and Frank Walsh. On December 3rd, 1941, Ellis Atwood bought almost everything else that remained of the BNHR, including rail, rolling stock, and locomotive number seven, which he had intended to put to work around his cranberry bogs in South Carver, Massachusetts, a few miles south of Boston. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor put his plans on hold for the next five years, but the BNHR equipment had been saved from the scrapmongers. On November 17, 1945, a flatbed truck unloaded BNHR number no. 7 at Atwood's Cranberry Plantation at South Carver, and work was begun on what would become a 5.42 mile loop of track through the bogs a route actually longer than one of the real two-footers, the Little Kennebec Central, and only a half mile shorter than the Monson. Since this was to be his own working railroad, Ellis D. Atwood dubbed his new cranberry hauler the Edaville Railroad, incorporating his name's initials. The name, however, had predated the railroad, for Atwood had been putting up a brightly lighted Christmas village on his cranberry property at South Carver for many years using the name Edaville. In short order, Atwood purchased number eight from Holton Walsh, and the venerable two-foot historian Linwood Moody discovered two Monson locomotives still intact in a scrap dealer in Rochester, New York. This brought Atwood's roster up to four locomotives, and he already had numerous freight and passenger cars for them to pull. While Atwood did not consider the Edaville a museum or tourist attraction, but a functional railroad in the truest tradition of the two-footers. The remarkable little trains could not help but attract attention. So as early as 1946, Atwood began giving his visitors, whom he considered his guests, rides on the as-yet uncompleted railroad. When this passenger business began to become a nuisance, Atwood put a 25-cent ticket price on the ride to discourage visitors. <laughs> it didn't work, and soon he found himself in the full-blown tourist business.